Welcome to Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs. Simulation theory claims that it is more likely than not that we are living in a highly sophisticated computer program, one that provides us with the illusion that we exist in a natural world governed by the laws of physics. The evidence, they say, is all the crazy things around us, the stories we see in the news or on the internet that make us say, that can't be real, or more specifically, I guess there's a glitch in the simulation. According to some interpretations, there's no way for us to tell for sure whether the world around us and the very paths our lives take are real or subroutines in a vast and complicated computer game. Or is there? Let's find out in Reset. My life sucks, I said, lying on my back on the somewhat uncomfortable couch of my therapist's office. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Dr. Pototo replied, while scribbling furiously on the small pad she held in her lap. Excuse me? You know, just reboot. I'm not a computer, I said dismissively, wondering where my stodgy therapist had suddenly found a sense of humor. She paused her writing and peered at me over the tortoise-shell frames of her reading glasses. You do realize all of this is a simulation, she said plainly. I stared back at her, waiting for the middle-aged features to break into a mischievous smile. Such an expression of humor was not forthcoming. Do you mean to claim that you haven't heard of simulation theory? She remarked, returning her gaze to her notepad and resuming her scribbling. I actually was familiar with the concept she was talking about. The theory goes that, just as we can create simulations like those in computer games or scientific models of biological processes or the Earth's climate, it stands to reason that we eventually will be able to create one that matches the complexity of what we know is real life. And if that simulation is advanced enough, it could create another simulation, and so on. So, mathematically, it is almost a certainty that our existence is merely a simulation being run either by an extremely advanced race of beings, or a byproduct of a simulation creating a simulation, perhaps several layers deep. It was enough to make your head spin. That's just pure speculation, I said dismissively. Really? she asked. Then how do you explain TikTok millionaires? Honestly, social media influencer as a job? And what about octopi and platypi? The fact that the moon always shows the same side to the earth. The Big Bang. Nicholas Cage is a sex symbol. In fact, look no further than my name, Potato. Sounds like someone's discarded typo for the word potato. The signs are all around you. I thought about what she said. I had to admit, the Nicholas Cage thing had perplexed me since my youth. But the fact that the moon completed exactly one rotation per revolution around the Earth so that it constantly presented the same face all the time was merely physics, wasn't it? Or was it just a lazy programmer not wanting to design the backside? The therapist finally noticed that I had stopped talking, or perhaps merely ran out of things to write about me on her pad, and sat back and stared at me with a pitying expression. Surely I'm not the first one to tell you that you're not really real. Yes, as a matter of fact, you are, I replied a note of anxiety creeping into my voice. She looked at me as if trying to remember something, then returned her attention to her notepad and started flipping back the pages, scanning for something. Oh, right, my mistake. You're an NPC. You're supposed to be oblivious to all those details. Sorry. So, she flipped back to the page she had been previously writing on. Your life sucks. Tell me more about that. An NPC? I asked. You think I'm a non-playing character? Yes, but don't let that bother you. Most people are. But you're not. No, of course not, she said with a laugh. Don't be ridiculous. Now please focus. Your life sucks. Is this a joke? Is there some equivalent to April Fool's Day in September that I'm not aware of? What kind of therapist are you? Aren't you supposed to try and make me feel better? Now, in addition to dealing with my depression, I have to worry that my life is just a series of bits and bites that mean nothing because I'm just a pre-programmed sprite bouncing around some random simulation. Actually, you're probably made of qubits. Quantum computing is much more likely to be the foundation of a massive simulation like this. Whatever, I shouted as I sat up and glared at Dr. Pototo. How can you expect me to talk about my problems after telling me that it all just doesn't matter? She shrugged. As I said, my mistake, but please do try to put it out of your mind. I can't, I insisted, raising my voice to just under a shout. It's all I can think about now. Why did you have to say that? Say what? Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Well, that usually does the trick, doesn't it? You want me to kill myself and come back to life? 
No, no, Dr. Potato said, shaking her head. Don't do that. I didn't mean it literally. I was thinking you could do a reset, return to a previous save point, and clear out some of the complications you've accumulated. I would do it for you, but I do enjoy the challenge of trying to help people with talk therapy. It's very challenging. Save point? I don't have a reset button, I said, wondering why I was still sitting in this office, allowing this woman to mess with my head. Dr. Potato sighed. All right, since this is partially my fault. Partially? I asked. She ignored my question. I'll tell you where to find your control panel so you can reset and forget all about this. Really? It's that simple? <laughs> then why am I paying you a hundred bucks an hour? Do you want my help or not? She asked, folding her notebook closed and resting it in her hands in her lap. Okay, sure, I said, humoring her, wondering if I would be able to cancel the automatic withdrawals she was making on my credit card. When you get home, open your bedroom closet and look for a spot about the size of a paperback book on the back wall that feels like it doesn't belong. What do you mean, feels like it doesn't belong? Have you ever done one of those magic eye posters, where it looks like a random pattern of some sort, but if you cross your eyes slightly, you see a three-dimensional picture? Sure, I said. I actually was quite good at viewing them, much to the frustration of my girlfriend, who never could make them work for her. Stare at the back wall of your closet and try to do that. Then what? When you find the spot, trace its outline with your finger, and you'll have access to your control panel. Find the button that says Revert to Previous Save Point, and then pick a time and place before you are burdened with your current problems. My control panel, I repeated. Exactly. Revert to Previous Save Point, she finished for me. Gotcha, I said. She looked at me and smiled, giving me the clear indication that our session was over. I spent a good half hour slowly meandering my way back to my apartment, spending half the time furious with Dr. Potato at wasting my time, or worse, mocking me, and the other half wondering if it was true. Obviously it wasn't, but how did Nicolas Cage score that role opposite Cher in Moonstruck? No, no, that was crazy. I remember hearing that his uncle was some famous director, Scorsese or Coppola, one of those gangster movie guys. I resolved that as soon as I got home, I was going to look up whatever agency or department regulated psychologists in this state and file a formal complaint. When I did return to my apartment, however, instead of heading straight to my computer, I found myself standing in front of my bedroom closet. A part of me was starting to push aside the crazy notion that I was just a secondary character in a simulation, and I suspected that by morning, the daily chaos that was my life would erase the notion from my consciousness altogether. But another part of me was wondering, what if... I opened the closet door, grabbed the shirts and jackets hanging off the rod, and tossed them onto my bed. Once I had a clear view of the back wall of my closet, I stared at it, trying to stare past it as if I was deciphering an optical illusion. And then I saw it. A faint rectangle in the upper left corner. Without thinking, I reached out and traced its outline with the finger of my right hand. And a screen appeared. I nearly fell as I stepped back in surprise. There it was. My control panel. It was all true. I could feel my heart racing, my breathing becoming shallower, my vision constricting as if I was going to pass out. I leaned over, allowing the blood to rush back to my brain, then I immediately thought, what blood? What brain? I was just cubits. But apparently my cubits followed specific physiological rules that affected me just as if I was real, whatever reality was. Maybe I was dreaming, only this didn't feel like a dream. It was too coherent. Once I got myself back under control, I stood up and inspected the panel. My name was prominent at the top, and next to it was the button labeled Revert to Previous Save Point. But my attention was drawn to a series of properties, I guess is the best word to describe them. There were dozens visible, but I could see that they were part of a scrolling list. I reached out and touched the screen, wondering if it worked in the same manner as my phone. It did. I was able to scroll through the list and see the settings for hundreds of aspects of my life. Near the top was anxiety and its value was 92. Between the property name and the value was a slider control, positioned almost all the way to the right. I reached out and moved it to the left. As I did so, the number changed from 92 to 31. Suddenly, I felt as if a great burden had been lifted from me. All the thoughts that constantly filled my mind with uncertainty and fear. Would I lose my job? Could I pay my rent? Did I have cancer? Were gone, or at least greatly diminished. I scrolled down and spotted confidence and raised it from 27 to 85. Then I continued searching for more settings with a determination and purpose I'd never felt before. 
Perseverance, 35 to 90. Fear, 75 to 15. I noticed that there was a tab at the top of the list that had different categories. In addition to the psychological settings, there was one for physical and one for environmental. In the physical settings, I adjusted my height from 5 foot 4 to an even 6 foot. Fortunately, my clothes changed along with my body. I changed my hair from balding to luxurious, and my musculature from dad bod to athletic. Under the environmental settings, I increased my wealth from $4,342 to $1,076. I didn't want to be too greedy. But I also upgraded my Honda Civic to a Porsche Spider. I felt amazing. Okay, I had to admit, it was a little disconcerting to discover that the world was indeed just a simulation. But at the same time, I now had a level of control over my life that people would kill for. Now my life was suddenly good. I no longer had to worry about making ends meet, wondering why other people won life's lottery and I always seemed to get the short end of the stick. Now I had the golden ticket, and I was going to use it. I picked out a shirt I had bought years earlier and never wore because I didn't think it looked good on me. Now, when I slipped it on and buttoned it across my sculpted abs and pecs, it looked amazing. I went into the bathroom and picked up my comb to make sure my hair was strategically covering the balding spots, only to find that I had a quaff that would make Patrick Dempsey jealous. I looked at my teeth, then rushed back into my bedroom to up them from slightly askew and yellow to perfectly straight and gleaming white. Then I noticed that the fob to my Porsche was on the corner of the kitchen counter, where I normally threw the keys to my Civic. I rushed outside, clicked the unlock button, and found my yellow 918 Spider parked across the street. I got in and drove to Emily's house. I wondered if she would recognize me. Would my girlfriend of two years be surprised at the changes I had assigned myself? Or would she even notice? I rang the bell and got my answer. Jeremy, she shouted as she threw her arms around my neck and pulled herself up for a passionate kiss. That was new, but I wasn't complaining. What a nice surprise. I didn't think I was going to see you until Saturday. I couldn't wait that long, I told her, smiling. My relationship with Emily had always been one of those things I worried about. In my mind, she was a solid six, bordering on seven. Well, I was at best a high four or low five, and considered myself lucky that she didn't realize she was out of my league. But now I was a nine, nine and a half, and my paranoia that she was constantly looking to trade up was gone. But I wondered. Let's go to the bedroom, I suggested. Jeremy, she admonished playfully. I'm a mess. You're always beautiful to me, I assured her. She blushed and then placed her hand in mine and bashfully led me to her bedroom. Just give me a minute in the bathroom, okay? Sure, I replied. Emily smiled and disappeared behind the bathroom door. I went to her closet. It was jammed with blouses and dresses and pants and shorts. I tore them all down from the rack and dumped them on the closet floor. Then I stood back and let my focus drift, searching for her control panel. There it was, right in the center. I traced its outline and the screen appeared. I scrolled through her psychological menu, noting that her libido was already set pretty high, but nudged her self-confidence up a few points. Under the physical menu, I increased her cup size from A to C and took her weight down a few pounds. She had always complained about both, and I figured it wouldn't do any harm. But that's all I changed. Except, under her environmental settings, I tweaked her bed size from full to California king to accommodate my increased stature. I closed the closet door just as Emily emerged from the bathroom. She was wearing the silk kimono I'd given her a couple Christmases before. She always looked great in it, but now she was absolutely stunning. Are you ready? She asked. I nodded eagerly, and we spent the rest of the afternoon in bed until we both were exhausted and completely satisfied. The next morning, I left before Emily awoke. I knew she had to get to work, and if I stayed, I risked making her late. Besides, I had my own job to get to. I hated my job, but did I have to? I rushed home and opened my closet door. The control panel was gone, so I stared past the back wall again, traced the outline, and brought it back to life. I scrolled through the environmental settings until I found the job option and slid it from worker to CEO. Then I thought better of it and backed it off to VP of Marketing. Actually, I didn't need a new job anymore considering my hefty bank balance, but there were a couple of scores I wanted to settle before I retired. I drove to the office and pulled my Porsche into my reserved parking space. I took the private elevator up to the executive suite, strode confidently to my glass-walled office, exchanging pleasantries with my assistant, and sat down behind the wide wooden desk. My photo of Emily smiled at me. I smiled back, enjoying the peace and quiet of my own space, no longer stuck in those cramped open-plan workstations I used to work at. 
Johnson, what are you doing in that office? A voice asked. I looked over at my office door to see my old manager, Eric, standing there, a perplexed look on his face. Why did it bother him that I was here? Everyone else took it in stride as if it had always been this way. I thought you were an NPC, he stated condescendingly. Uh, what? I replied, trying to play ignorant. He pulled out his phone and started tapping furiously at the screen. Aha, he said. I was right. You are an NPC. Who bumped you up to VP? Was it Killian or Farnsworth? I don't know what you're talking about, I said. Maybe you should get back to work. I have a lot on my plate and I don't have time for your jokes. He laughed. Wow, someone really messed with your settings. He continued tapping away at his phone, then his eyes widened. I knew it. He smiled and looked at me, shaking his head. Back to the sales department for you. He swiped at his screen, gently at first, then more purposefully. Damn, I'm locked out. He stared at me for a moment, then appeared to have an idea. Moorhead should have high enough access. I'll just revert you to a previous save point and you'll be back to your miserable self. Eric slipped his phone in his pocket and started walking toward the corner office where CEO Michelle Moore had ruled the roost. I stepped out of my office and checked my Rolex. It changed into a Timex. Damn it, I wasn't going down without a fight. Hold on my calls, I said to my assistant, then raced for the elevator, then out of the building. My Porsche was gone, but I spotted my Civic parked at the far end of the lot. As I ran toward it, I could feel my strides shortening as my height and subsequently my inseam shrunk back to their previous settings. I drove like a madman, racing to my apartment, leaving my car double-parked and bounded up the stairs of my building. I fumbled with keys and doors until I finally was back at my bedroom closet, staring at the back wall. Only I couldn't see it. That faint rectangle was beyond my ability to discern it. I stopped, took a deep breath, stepped back a little, then tried again. My focus loosened as I stared past the wall. Suddenly, there it was. I was no longer in the upper left corner, but near the floor. I reached down and traced the outline, and my control panel appeared. I breathed a sigh of relief. Then I noticed that the revert to previous save point button was flashing, and instead of the words it previously displayed, there was a countdown message. Reverting to save point in, and a robotic voice started counting down. Ten. Nine. How could I stop it? If it reverted as it promised, then I would forget everything, even how to access my settings. Everything I had changed would go away. Emily would leave me. There was no obvious cancel button, but I noticed a small icon near the bottom that looked like a warning sign, a yellow triangle with an exclamation point inside of it. I tapped it. A new screen appeared, but the save point button continued counting down. Seven. Six. There was a menu of advanced settings. One of them was labeled Upgrade MPC to Autonomous Mode. Five. Four. I smashed it. A new dialog box appeared with a seemingly endless list of Autonomous Mode preferences. Three. I didn't have time for this. There was a button near the top that was marked Randomized Preferences. One. I tapped it. I sat in a comfortable leather chair while a woman lay reclined on an oddly familiar couch. There was a notepad in my lap and a pen in my hand, and I wore wire rim reading glasses. My life sucks, the woman said with a tone of despair and hopelessness. I smiled. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Thank you for listening to Reset, written by Rich Hosick, on the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's Fiction podcast. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on Audible, and share these stories with your friends and anyone who enjoys audiobooks. Speaking of audiobooks, if you're a fan of the paranormal, Near Death, a rainy day investigation, is currently being serialized on this very podcast. New chapters are posted weekly. And if you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out As Read By Me at, not surprisingly, as read by me.com. They have an eclectic mix of fiction, poetry, and essays that are sure to keep you entertained, all read by the authors. You can find out more about this podcast and the author of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosick.com. Thanks again, and all the very best. <laughs>